welcome everybody to our uh, sleep apnea summit. And my name is Kevin Bradley, and I'm delighted to present today on anesthesia and sleep and what you need to know. So today we're really lucky to have um, Dr. Francis Chung and um, Gilles Friedman. And Gilles is one of our chief strategy officers at American Sleep Apnea Association. We're also delighted to have Teresa Schumard in the wings and uh, she will fuel questions. Um, and if you do put the questions in the Q&A, we can get to them at the end of the presentation and we would love to hear from you. So again, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Chung and we're delighted again. Thank you for joining us on this important topic. So Dr. Chung is a professor of the Department of Anesthesiology and Pain Medicine at the University of Toronto. University Health Network and ResMed Chair of Anesthesia, Sleep and Perioperative Medicine at the University Health Network here in Toronto. She is the co-founder and past president of the Society of Anesthesia and Sleep Medicine and her research interests are in several areas. Keynotes are sleep apnea, pain, pain safety, monitoring, perioperative medicine and ambulatory anesthesia. The multidisciplinary research team that she leads at Toronto Western Hospital is recognized nationally and internationally for contributing to several key areas of research in obstructive sleep apnea, sleep and pain. So again, we're delighted to have you all here and thank you again for participating. Yes, welcome Dr. Chung. So Gilles, I, it's very interesting when we were preparing for this and um, you know, you, you do have a story to share. It's quite a difficult story, but I think it would be wise to start with that. And then Dr. Chung will lead into her presentation and she does have some slides. And again, we'll um, take some questions from our key participants um, at the end of the presentation. And this presentation is being recorded, but for those that are here live, we appreciate you joining us. So take it away. Uh, yes, so until about five months ago, I had never heard of any connection between or any risk uh, of anesthesia on people who suffer from sleep apnea. And I was made uh, aware of uh, that potential issue, not potential, that real issue and started reading uh, quite a few peer-reviewed publications to become educated and then I went to the website of the National Society of Anesthesiologists in the U.S. and found their guidelines. They have very specific guidelines about what to do uh, and what questions to ask before anesthesia to make sure that you do not give the wrong type of anesthesia to someone who may have sleep apnea. Uh, it turns out that, that, that one of the board members of the association related to us a personal story where a member of a family had uh, a very serious problem because even though they mentioned to the anesthesiologist that the patient had uh, sleep apnea, the anesthesiologist said, uh, it's not uh, really, we will talk about this after the anesthesia, obviously unaware of uh, the national guidelines. The result of which was that the patient suffered uh, a very serious condition, probably directly connected to the wrong anesthesia. So that brought that issue straight uh, in front of uh, our eyes. And we decided that this is something that really needs to be discussed more openly and that the association has to raise awareness of this very real issue as much as we can. So this is the first time we are doing an event about it, but I'm sure it's not the last one. And we are very lucky that we have uh, one of the great experts here with us today to discuss with us and to basically tell us what are the main issues. Sure, Gilles, and I think that's really important to highlight there because, you know, we never really think that we're going to need surgery. Some surgeries are elective, some are, you know, critical, they're, you know, emergency surgery. And I think it's, it's really beneficial for our population out there to be educated on, you know, all the above scenarios and what to tell their doctor, their anesthesiologist about their health. 
So Dr. Chung, I think this is a good segue for you to discuss um, your experience and your research in um, our population of people with obstructive sleep apnea who are undergoing anesthesia for a surgical procedure. Thank you, um, Kevin, for the kind introduction. And thanks, Jill, for presenting a, uh, a case um, that you are aware of. I'd like to share a few slides and talk about 10 or 15 minutes. So um, I'd like to talk about obstructive sleep apnea, anesthesia, and surgery. So we are aware of this problem um, in the when patients with sleep apnea are coming for surgery. It is a very rare problem, but we want to find out more about it because one death or one critical event is too many. So the Society of Anesthesia and Sleep Medicine, together with um, the American Society of Anesthesiologists, we develop a sleep um, death and near miss registry. And we ask people to report the cases in North America. And over two years, there were 75 cases that were reported. And these patients, 83%, they already have a diagnosis of sleep apnea. So is what um, Jill was saying in that case, the patient's already diagnosed by sleep study. However, 17% of these patients actually don't have any history, but they may be suspected to have sleep apnea. And the, these patients, out of these patients, majority of them have death or severe brain damage, which you can see in the blue, 63%. And the critical event are 37%. And the critical event means these patients did have an event, but they recover from the event and may not have suffered harm. Now, these patients are not too old. They're around 52 years old. And also, um, they are a bit obese. Majority of them, they are elective surgery, but about 15% are emergency surgery. And majority of these patients undergo general anesthesia. So essentially, um, what happened is, um, when the patient have this death, or critical event, majority of them happened in the surgical wards. Only 20% are in the PACU or step down ICU. And some of them are in the operating room at the end of surgery or on transport. Now, about 20% of these patients actually happen at home after their surgery. So about the timing is two hours in the recovery room after surgery. When they're in the ICU or monitor is about 12 hours when the event happened. When it's in the ward is about 16%. And also in home is 28%. And that's three to uh, like, that's four days after, up to four days after the event, after the surgery, right? Um, it's three hours to four days. Yeah. So the death or severe brain damage, what happened is it occur, actually you can see a lot more deaths um, in the ward. The death is represented by blue or brain yeah. damage. The yellow just represent critical event is recover. And you can see more death or brain damage in the ward or home. But if the patient is monitored in the PACU ICU less. So essentially you can see a difference in here. If the patient are monitored at the time of the event, then it would not be uh, less of a problem. They are more able to recover. So the cardiovascular event we look at within one month after surgery account for 19% of these patients um, who actually have OSA. 
um, it would occur. So the primary complications is about twofold, much higher. So essentially for the sleep apnea patients, um, they can be different kinds in terms whether the patient is an obese or whether the patient is thin, they may still have sleep apnea. Or if it is in the Asian population, often enough they have uh, receding jaws and that caused the problem. Yeah. So we developed the stop bang questionnaire actually um, to identify patient at risk. So S-T-O-P-B-A-N-G represents, S represents snoring. So essentially, are you like much more likely to have loud snoring um, two or three at night time so that actually um, somebody can hear you behind closed door? And are you tired, sleepy, or fatigued during daytime? Or the third question is, did anybody observe you stop breathing uh, in, at nighttime? And do you have a history of high blood pressure? And the B represent body mass index, which is a calculated with the height and weight. H is more than 50 years old, neck circumference, and also males. Um, they are more likely to have issues. Um, if I could just interject as well and just, um, you know, quantify some of the slides that you um, presented and thank you for putting those together. It is interesting and it raised a little issue in my head when, um, you know, a while ago here in Ontario, I interviewed um, a um, director of the surgical suite who implemented um, red bonnets for people to be identified um, in surgical situations that were at risk of sleep apnea or at risk of a, what we would call a compromised airway. So again, they, they use your stop bang theory and questionnaire um, to identify some people that are undiagnosed. And these people that are going to go in surgery um, where typically you wear a blue bonnet to keep your hair away so there's no cross contamination, but they're um, given red which is a great idea to identify people again with a compromised or difficult airway or who may be at risk of apneic events or especially in the presence of you know anesthetic as you know yourself it's going to be um, a difficult airway management. The thing is with the research that you did do when 49% of people had events in the ward it almost feels like to me that that red bonnet should continue because obviously pre Perry, you know, during the surgical procedure and post operatively when you're in the recovery room um, and when the nurses are trying to keep you awake so they know that you can support your airway, that had the least events of critical events or critical outcomes. So it almost feels like this should follow through your whole hospitalization. Any thoughts on that? And, and were you familiar with that initiative, Dr. Chung? Um, I'm not aware, but I think a lot of the hospital um, do have some kind of um, initiative in that sense that, you know, protocol, because the American Society of Anesthesiologists, the uh, Society of Anesthesia and Sleep Medicine, um, it is a smaller society, but it's composed of sleep physicians and ENT surgeons and also anesthesiologists with a special interest in sleep issues. So um, we have published guidelines and a lot of the hospital do follow those guidelines to establish how to manage this patients before surgery, during surgery and after the surgery. The reason is um, with the sleep apnea patients with their airway, they, with the repeated um, stopping of breathing during the night, they're much more sensitive uh, to opioids. And opioids often are required to treat the pain after surgery, especially during the first two or three nights 
if you have major surgery. Um, so they are much more sensitive to opioid. And that opioid by itself also suppress or have depressed the breathing. Yes. So compounded with obstructive sleep apnea it makes it much worse. So I think it is very, very important to identify who are these patients, whether they, if they have the issue, if they do have sleep apnea, they would make sure that they are optimized with CPAP or other treatment before they come for surgery. And then during the surgery, then we have to choose the most appropriate type of anesthetic because there are different types of anesthetic and also the appropriate type of medication, maybe shorter acting drug, the drugs that you can recover quicker. And then afterwards, you also make sure that we do monitor these patients that may have trouble, as you say, Kevin, that more issues occur in the ward or after discharge. Because if the patient is monitored in the recovery room, it's one-to-one -one or one-to-two monitoring. So essentially, it is um, easier to detect if there is a problem. Yeah. However, in the ward, um, it's more difficult because one nurse is taking care of many patients. So probably there needs to be more monitoring on the ward or more protocol to be developed so that those who really need it, they will have the help that they get. Or, or more sign, more external sign for each patient that that patient is at risk. That yes. would already, that is, um, so the stop bank questionnaire that you developed, uh, it's only because you are here today that I realized that the stop bank questionnaire was developed by an anesthesiologist. I thought it was just created by a, a doctor in sleep medicine. And it's really interesting to see that this questionnaire, which is now, I think, the standard for asking people if they have sleep apnea, or at least it's the standard questionnaire to raise awareness that a patient probably has sleep apnea comes from someone who saw the risk. It's not just that uh, it was not just a clinical diagnosis for like saying you need treatment. You are trying to avoid a very big risk. Yes, I agree. The reason is um, I think a lot of times we really do not know which patient has sleep apnea and the patient themselves are not aware they have sleep yes. apnea because it developed during sleep, right? You have snoring, so who cares? But the important thing is the sleep apnea would have increased cardiovascular problem, would have cancer, increased risk of cancer, autoimmune diseases, increased pulmonary complication, all of these. They're associated not even with anesthesia, the risk. It's associated with health span, associated with lifespan and living span. So sure. I do think it is very important that people are aware of it and make sure that you know um, we have to deal with it. Um, very luckily, Stop Bank is now being used um, in uh, a lot of population. It's being used in the general population as a screening tool. It's used in the commercial driver because a lot of accidents happen when people, uh, all the trained and the pilot accident and the truck driver accident happen is because they're not aware they have sleep apnea. So also it's being used by the dentist and the um, orthodontist, you know, as well. And also by the cardi cardiologist because hypertension and all those associated, um, it can develop hypertension, associated with hypertension, associated with increased risk of heart attack, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah. in a terminal case, these can be associated with pulmonary hypertension. Yeah. And the Absolutely. interesting thing about it is what is so-called the obesity hyperventilation syndrome. Because in North America, we have so many patients that are obese, 
and they actually may be short of breath and they are, are not even aware that they have sleep apnea and also morbid obesity. So combining it together, it can have obesity hyperventilation syndrome. Yeah. And with the obesity hyperventilation syndrome, if it's not diagnosed, after one year, 20% of them are dead, if not treated. So it's- all, all, of this, all of this makes me think that uh, the uh, association, uh, our sleep apnea association together, we should be working with all the appropriate professional societies to do a very simple campaign. Stop bang is really great, but I think it's a second step. Already stop bang, those 10 questions are a bit too much for the general public. If we could just make a like a national campaign of awareness that if you snore, you're already at a significant risk of, of having sleep apnea. Just that one thing, which is the simplest, people know if they snore or they don't snore. Something like uh, the national campaign they had for many years about gut milk. A very simple like PSA campaign. I think if we if we all work together on creating a campaign like this, we could save so many lives. Raise awareness to people that if you snore, you probably have sleep apnea. And if you have sleep apnea, you have to go and check if you have high blood pressure, if you have diabetes, if uh, I mean, if you have surgery, you should be you should absolutely make your, your doctor aware if they don't ask you a question. Be more forceful and uh, volunteer that uh, you may have a sleep issue that needs to be treated differently. Yeah. I think it's a great idea, but um, I think maybe I suggest that we modify the question a little bit because yeah. the snoring has to be 50 decibel in order to actually consider the snoring. So probably we can ask, do you snore? Is it loud enough to be yes. heard behind closed door? so that you actually classify the snoring um, to be a little bit more specific because most of us may snore when we have some people drink a bit of alcohol some people are very tired sure. you know so maybe modify that just a touch and i do think it's a good idea of yeah. a awareness campaign yeah. yeah, and I mean, I, I feel that having a questionnaire for people that are going to maybe have an elective surgical procedure and get the benefit of having an anesthesiologist uh, review them. Um, there's also, I'm sure, that the anesthesiologists are looking at things like recessed jaw, neck circumference, obesity, and maybe in their back of their mind, there you know yourself, Dr. Chung, if somebody is going to be a difficult intubation, and by that I mean difficult to put a breathing tube down or not, right? So I think the questionnaire highlights a lot of risk factors for people. I feel it's simple enough for people to answer the questions, but also there's a you know, an obligation on the specialist, like someone like yourself to say, well, I think this person could be at risk of, you know, again, saying a compromised or, you know, airway that could be problematic. So I agree with Jill that, you know, it, it should be user friendly, but it also should be pointed out there that people should be aware of this going in that aren't really aware that they even have a diagnosis of sleep apnea because we're sure. assuming that when you snore someone's telling you you snore but there's many people out there that live alone do you know what i mean so it's difficult for those pop people in the population to say well i don't know I, I feel tired and i think it's a great tool to identify those that don't have a sleep partner to say you're keeping me up all night you know I mean, we, we all have to work on this incredible number that more than about 80% of people with sleep apnea are undiagnosed. Yeah. Uh, and so we have to come up with like really simple awareness campaigns because those can be repeated and repeated and repeated and get like, we need to have something, simple messages that are repeated many, many times so that people in the end become aware that this is really an issue. And then it becomes very easy for once they know about it. When you said if you have, uh, if you're going to have anesthesia, you absolutely need to answer this stop bank questionnaire. If you're going to do this, you absolutely need to respond to this stop bank questionnaire. 
But if you say to people, you need to answer this stop bank questionnaire and they've never heard of sleep apnea, many of them are questioning, why are you asking me those questions? People, if pe as long as people are unaware that disrupted sleep is a very serious medical condition, it's hard to move forward. I, 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 a lot of the hospitals in USA are doing using stop bank to screen. Not, uh, not. I don't know what is the percentage, but there are a number of uh, hospitals are doing it. Actually, um, I, I know that when there is a problem of death or critical event that occur in the hospital resulting in brain damage, a lot of the time it does not get into the media. Yes. The reason is the hospital know that they've done something wrong and a lot of time they just pay um, in a so sort of a settlement. So, and it's quietly dealt with, you know, in that way, because I am aware of a, a a um, known hospital um, institutions in which they have, and the insurance company actually say, if you don't have a protocol, if you don't change, we are not going to insure you. And that's when they actually make the changes. Yes. So I do think we need a carrot and a stick a lot of times and the awareness campaign would be a good thing, I do think. Yeah. And the awareness campaign has to be done on two, like uh, two complementary uh, world, the world of medical professionals, which is what you're doing, and the, the general public. Yes. A lot of pressure has to come from the general public who has to become aware of those issues because the more the public is aware of the issue of disrupted sleep, the more they are gonna start asking questions to their primary care physicians and other doctors who are taking care of them. I agree. And actually, I just published a paper on COVID-19 and also sleep apnea. So what I did is we involved um, 14 different countries and about 24 investigators in the world. And we sent a survey and in which we asked the stop questionnaire. So I cannot do the bank part because the next conference and things. So the stop questionnaire is also validated by me. And it's two or four question positive is high risk. So we actually found we have 25,000 people who answer the questions. And we have about 600 to 700 people who have COVID-19. And we asked whether they are hospitalized or whether they have, have to be in ICU. We find those who have high risk of sleep apnea defined by the STOP questionnaire, actually more likely, two times more likely to be admitted to hospital or require ICU admission. Sure. Yeah, so yeah. It, it means, you know, it's also other issues as well. Yeah. Sure. I mean, the, this stop bank questionnaire is uh, really, I said before, it's really revolutionary. It's simple enough so that you can get some response pretty fast. We are rebuilding our website and we're going to use it to help people figure out, uh, since many of the people coming to our website know either very little or nothing about sleep apnea, we decided that this was the perfect questionnaire to help them figure out if they are at high risk or not of having sleep apnea. Yeah, that would be good. I actually, on our website, we have, because many uh, people actually use us, so we have a website uh, so that I don't have to answer the questions, and we have many different languages as well, so, you know, um, we can talk later on so yeah. that you can actually link it or you can use right. it. Absolutely. Um, so that there are Absolutely. different languages as well, so if that somebody... United States, there are a lot of people who are different ethnicity. They they can use it as well. Yes, we are uh, we are paying very close attention to health disparities in the U.S. And so, whatever we can do to help lower health disparities one way or the other, including producing pages in the appropriate language, is going to be more than welcome. Thank you for uh, doing this. Right.
So Dr. Chung, say for example, I am a um, CPAP user and I'm having an elective surgical procedure coming up and I have the pleasure of meeting my anesthesiologist prior uh, at a hospital that doesn't use a questionnaire. What kind of things out there should I be highlighting to the anesthetist to let them know about myself? So um, I think for patients, either you are a CPAP user, so presumably you are being treated with CPAP. And I guess you actually, some hospital require them to bring CPAP to the hospital, some don't. So um, I think you have to make sure when you see your surgeon and when you see your anesthesiologist, you have to highlight, just say, if you have heart disease, heart attack before, you, or if you have diabetes, or you have high blood pressure, you would tell your surgeon, you would tell your anesthesiologist, you would tell your nurse who is taking, who are taking care of you that you have such a disease. So having sleep apnea is no, no different from having diabetes or hypertension, it's a disease. And so essentially, communication is most important that everyone, the surgeon, the anesthesiologist, and also the nurses that are taking care of you, they have to know. And you have to make sure that you have your CPAP in some hospital like ours, we bring the CPAP to the hospital. And then the, there is the um, personnel that will check the CPAP and use it. In some of the hospitals in North America, they actually don't use their own CPAP. They will give the CPAP from the hospital using the same titration. So I think for people, it's very important to make sure that we wear our CPAP after um, the surgery. Um, before, when people have bariatric surgery, they were thinking, oh, with the CPAP, then maybe it would blow the air into the stomach and cause the heasons. Um, of the newly bariatric surgery, but it has been shown, study has been shown, it would not do that. So it's very safe to actually wear the CPAP in the recovery room and in the ward as well to continue to wear them. So it is very important. But besides that, it's also very important after surgery, most of us would be lying on our back. And when you are on your back, supine positions, a lot of time the sleep apnea would increase. So we have to make sure you don't lie on your back. You can be on your side or it can be head up positions, semi reclining positions is important so that the fluid doesn't go from your legs and go up to your lungs and to your neck, making your sleep apnea worse after surgery. So those are important, uh, very important point. And if you are using your CPAP, which is a good thing, but still make sure because there are cases that are reported that patients use their CPAP when in the morning they take off the CPAP and then they receive a dose of opioid and then they fell asleep and they get obstructed. So we have to make sure in the daytime if you are sleepy, you have to wear your CPAP yes. because you actually have surgery. You are maybe sleeping in the daytime as well. Yeah, yeah. So it's not just nighttime. Um, you can get obstructed in the daytime because you receive some medication like yeah. opioid. So it is important. Yeah. I suppose what you just mentioned is uh, becomes even a bigger issue with, with patients that still suffer from uh, daytime sleepiness in normal times. Yes, I agree, yeah. You know, and I um, think you raised a great point there because I actually um, had visited a patient of mine today who was a kidney donor. And when I went to see her, it was day two post-op. She was already on, she got rid of, some people might be familiar with, I always do this, the patient controlled analgesia where they're getting opioids. She was already on um, oral and, um, but when I went to her today around 2 p.m., she was asleep. So I think that's a great highlight to emphasize that 
we're conditioned to wear it at night when we sleep and take it off during the day when we wake up. But then if you're on something that's an opioid and you're giving yourself this all the time, it's going to relax the diaphragm, it's going to relax the breathing and everything. And that's a time where not only yourself, but healthcare providers should be cognizant of the fact that this person should have their um, mask on all the time during opioid use. And I, I think that's a great point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And I, I do think that um, there are lots of choices as well for anesthetic because there's general anesthetic. But nowadays there's regional anesthesia. You can have a spinal, you can have an epidural, um, or you can have local anesthetic or regional anesthesia. So if you have surgery on your arms, you just need, you know, freeze the arm, or you can just freeze the legs or freeze the area. Or a lot of time, this called the monitor anesthesia care, the sedation. So you can have different level of sedation. It can be deep sedation where you need much more medication, but you did not reach the level of deep anesthesia. And then in those, some of the cases, you have very light sedation in which actually if the surgeon talks to you, you can actually respond. Um, so it's light sedation to take the edge off. And then there are also moderate level in which you're not deeply sleep, you can be rousable. You'll be sleeping most of the time, you may not remember, but during the case, you can be aroused. So there are many different options as well, and you can do local anesthesia. So removal of a polyp, uh, some of the biopsy can be done on the local with a little bit of sedation. So there are options to be chosen. And also with the development of anesthesia, there are a lot of short acting anesthetic, and we don't have to use opioid. We can reduce the dose of opioid. We can use other medications like NSA and other medications that actually um, like gabapentinol drugs so that you don't have to use opioid is a mixture of other drugs as well. So there are options out there. Dr. Cheng, I see in the Q&A, we have two kind of related questions. Uh, the first one is from uh, Pat Tessier, which says, uh, I am with colonoscopy to be done soon. What do you recommend for sedation? Verst and fentanyl are what they suggested. Verset or fentanyl? Verset, yeah. verset. Yeah. I, I think yeah. a lot of times with uh, colonoscopy is not, um, is, is a little bit uncomfortable when they insert um, the, uh, the scope into the area. So a little bit of verset, very small dose, a little bit of fentanyl. And then you actually sort of drift off to sleep and you don't know anything and then you wake up. So it's really, really minor dose, very, very small dose is adequate. And it has to be titrated to the body weight as well. So if she's having colonoscopy and she's having, you have to make sure that there are people monitoring you during the procedure. You don't want the surgeon just do it themselves. And yes. they are the ones yes. who actually, I yes. would, because I'm an anesthesiologist, I would prefer to have an anesthesiologist or an anesthesia care team, somebody who actually be responsible for you, you know, as well. Yeah. So I think that is very important because a lot of times I know that in the dentist office, in some of the GI suite, and also a lot of time, it is the person who is doing the procedure, they are also responsible to give the anesthetic, then you cannot take care of two things at once. Sure. Because in the operating room, the anesthesiologist is actually, we have, um, we have undergraduate with medical school, we actually do um, anesthesia training, a lot of times we have fellowship. So we have training in anesthesia, but we also have training in pain medicine. We also have training in critical care. So that is very important because we can deal with emergency. We have to do critical care as part of our training. We have to do internal medicine as part of our training. So if there are anything, we can deal with it. So it is important to have someone who is qualified 
to give the anesthetic. Yeah. But at least for a colonoscopy, at least your recommendation is that you go in a doctor's office where there is more than just the doctors. Yes. Where you have at yeah. least like associated nurses that specialize in taking care of. Uh, yeah, only they specialize care. in yeah. actually giving the medication and qualify to give anesthesia. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, uh, not to give too much information here, but <laughs> when I had mine, um, I chose propofol, which is a drug that's short acting. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Chung, but it would be more regarded as not conscious sedation, but I was sedated. But it, it gets out of your system really quickly. And there was a, a, an anesthesiologist there present who was taking care of my airway. So I felt comfortable with that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I suppose that in the US, the presence of an anesthesiologist for a colonoscopy is almost going to be like not happening due to the costs. So it's probably the nurses. I mean, in the best case scenario, you're going to have nurses taking care of it. I um, actually agree with Kevin. Uh, we, we, you, we do use a lot of time for GI procedure. Um, we do use profile and actually very, very tiny dose. I, I do give a little bit of fentanyl um, versus sometimes, sometimes not depends on the patients because some may require a little bit more. The verset makes you not remember, essentially. We have another question. Uh, I had cerebellum stroke one day after a hip replacement in 2014. So I have concern regarding any procedure regarding meds for anesthesia. I appreciate your info. Do you feel it is important to meet anesthesia person prior to colonoscopy or outpatient procedure needing sedation? Uh, so um, she has a stroke after surgery. Is that what is said? Yes, I guess. Yeah, one day after uh, hip replacement. She has a stroke, so probably she does have risk factor for stroke. Um, so she is a higher risk patient. She may, I don't know her medical history. It could sure. be that she yeah. has hypertension. Um, she um, she has cardiovascular diseases. That's why she is more likely to have stroke. Now, nowadays, I don't know how many years ago that patients do um, she had her surgery or for her hip. Uh, nowadays, it is very routine to have heparin um, coverage for those procedure because it's major procedure. And a lot of the patients, they are, they are lying in bed before surgery, during the surgery is a couple of hours, and after surgery is, is uh, they're in bed. So now most people, they have coverage um, in terms to prevent uh, this kind of embolism, yeah. this kind of stroke. Yeah. For colonoscopy, it is an outpatient procedure. So it's, you don't need this kind of coverage to prevent um, yeah. the thrombosis or pulmonary embolism or stroke. So it's unlikely that you would have such an event. However, it is very important to make sure your blood pressure is controlled. So I, you know, if your blood pressure is labile, even without anesthesia and surgery, then it should be really controlled because of labile high blood pressure, then it's more likely to have a stroke. So I think um, if you have high blood pressure, make sure it's controlled. Sure. And if you may, Dr. Chung, I just want to clarify something in case the general public don't know, heparin is an anticoagulant. So given as a preventative measure prior to surgery um, and post-operatively to prevent blood clots. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah, that's great. There are great questions. We've got another question here. Okay. And this is from Robin. And I know that Robin is a nurse. She's a friend of mine. Um, she says that pulse oximetry can be useful if staff respond appropriately and don't think the alarms are false alarms or get alarm fatigue. Would anybody yeah. like to comment there? Yes, I, I do think um, um, oximetry is very useful. 
uh, for post-op monitoring. Uh, alarm fatigue is um, because when you, you put the oximetry on the finger, sometimes it can be dislodged or is in not proper positions, then it may have alarm fatigue. But on the whole, monitoring is important uh, in the sleep apnea patients because if there are desaturations uh, of any oxygen level, it is the first sign. So, and also during, after the surgery, you are not moving or because you have pain. A lot of times um, you have shallow breathing or because you're not moving, there may be collapse, a little bit the collapse of the lung in the basal part of the lung. So your oxygen saturation will decrease. And during sleep apnea and if the airway is not patent, then it's more likely to have oxygen desaturation and then with the opioid, um, the blockage, uh, you may not arouse enough to actually breathe again. And so all these factors will contribute to hypoxemia and ultimately some complication. So I agree with Robert about the uh, monitoring with oximetry. Okay. We have a question here from Alan. He says that he, with severe sleep apnea, my heart rate drops to the 30s. How should I manage my day-to-day -day life? They do not want to give me a pacemaker due to other conditions. Uh, so actually, I, I, with your particular medical conditions, I don't think I yeah. can. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Without I wanted to say that I'm yeah. not sure that you can answer that, uh, that, no, uh, that no. question. So, no. With understanding your... Yes. No, yeah. no. And I mean, Alan, you, you really should seek the advice from a cardiologist. Um, and it's not our mission here to, to provide um, individual advice to um, medical uh, conditions. So we support you in this and, and want you to get well. But um, our advice will be to seek out a, a cardiologist or talk to your family doctor. Yes, our strong advice here is that we cannot provide the, uh, this kind of particular advice. We are not here to provide medical advice. We can do it. I mean, we just, nobody has the right amount of information to be able to do this. But Robin, the, uh, the nurse, had a very interesting question. It is very interesting that 80% of uh, people are still undiagnosed. It seems like this number should be declining as more awareness occurs, but this number has not changed over the past 20 plus years. Why do you think that is? Um, actually, you know what it is, is actually at the present, um, there is a publication in 2019 in which they gather the data about sleep apnea patients. At the present, no sleep apnea patient or sleep apnea patient is almost 1 billion. And then 450 million have moderate to severe sleep apnea. So this figure is the diagnosed sleep apnea patient. Now, with the undiagnosed, as Robin is saying, 85% to 90% of people that actually have sleep apnea, they are not diagnosed because they are not aware that they have sleep apnea. And 10 years later, they may end up having hypertension, diabetes, autoimmune disease or cancer and all those issues. So I do think um, at the present is a disease that is under the radar still. Although it is there, but most people, even they have it, they do not want to use the CPAP because it's not comfortable. Um, it's difficult to wear, um, it's not romantic at night. So all these factors contribute to not being treated or they don't want to go to sleep lab or even have, they don't want to know. So there is a lot of barriers um, in terms of um, diagnosis. I think it is getting better. Now we have screening questionnaire. Um, we now have portable uh, sleep monitor, which is actually you can use at home without going to the sleep lab, but still there need to be education. 
there needs to be society like yours, the American Sleep Apnea, you know, um, your group yep. will be the one that carry the message and make it possible to have more people aware of it so that they can increase their health span. Yes, I, I just came back from a, a part of Texas with uh, like a population of about a million and a half people with uh, what was described to me as the highest incidence of diabetes in the entire country. Uh, probably the highest incidence of high blood pressure, probably some of the highest percentage of obesity due to the food and, uh, and lifestyle. And when I interviewed people who are now all the people that are treating their sleep apnea, not one of them was ever asked a single question by their primary care physician about sleep, not even sleep apnea not one question about how do you sleep? Do you sleep well, do you sleep well? So uh, people are undiagnosed and, uh, and when they go to the doctors, the doctors don't even ask them a single question about their sleep. So how do they know something about sleep apnea? It's sure. really it's a very complex problem that uh, as you said, it's a disease under the radar. Yeah, and I, I think it's actually important to know in terms of the, there's a graying of the North American population. So there's a large proportion of, of people that are getting older because these are the Zoomers, right? The yeah. Boomers. However, I think we are, there is an issue of cognitive decline. And we are all concerned, maybe we are not concerned about all other diseases or things. But we are aware and concerned about cognition. If we have decreasing cognition, we cannot function. And sleep apnea is known to be associated with cognitive yes. decline and also cognitive impairment and Alzheimer and dementia. So this is something I think we can play up to to increase the awareness of the public uh, in terms of that. Yeah, and I mean, to jump on Robin's comment, and I, I appreciate that, and I think it's a very valid comment and a very concerning one, and that's part of our mission, isn't it, Jill, to like get, you know, out there our message and to to encourage people to have a sleep study and, and, and get the help and advocate for themselves, because where do we start? Is that with the patients, with the population, or the doctor's office, right? And when you look at, if I can just draw on my own experience, having been a CPAP user for the last six or seven years, I was obviously a sleep pap or a, a, an obstructive sleep apnea person before I was diagnosed. Part of that was deni denial. And a lot of that played into the fact that like, is this just me? I have a busy job. I, I work 12, sometimes 24 hour shifts. Is it just a factor of getting old and I feel fatigued and foggy all the time? And, and sometimes it takes, again, your sleep partner to say, if you don't stop snoring or stop breathing, you're going into the other room again. Do you know what I mean? So there is an awareness component. There's also denial. There's also insurance inhibitions. Or there's a whole gamut of things. And that's, that's part of the American Sleep Apnea Association's um, mission to to get it out there to as many people as possible so we can get the help that they need yeah and and it's a medical condition that you don't experience right it's yes. all happening during the time you're unconscious yeah and you're not aware of it and you don't know why is it important to actually seek out yeah but when That's you get very, help that, that is very similar to the issue of uh, high blood pressure so, mm -hmm. I mean, so we have, uh, we could use the same uh, methods of education of the public at large that has been used to raise the awareness about the risk of sleep, of uh, high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Lots of men go off high blood pressure medications due to some of the um, side effects that, you know, are caused or... I've, I've heard people go off their medications because they say, well, I feel better now. And it's like, well, <laughs> yes, you feel better because you're on medications and now you've, you've gone off them and you're sitting here with a stroke, for example, you know? So it's really difficult. And I, and I think it is a good analogy to draw um, that with high blood pressure. And also I, I feel diabetes as well, you know, but some of these other conditions or syndromes are taken a lot more seriously than um, sleep apnea. Yep. 
So anything else before we wrap up? We're coming close to our hour and um, I think this generated some great conversation. Jill, is there any other questions that you'd like to highlight or ask? Um, uh, no, somebody just uh, said, I use a BiPAP. I assume all information also applies to BiPAP. It applies to all the PAP machines. That's, sure. I'm sure. sure. And I mean, be aware that this will be pushed onto our other social media um, avenues. And um, when that publication is um, available, if people do have conversation or questions, it's always great to have peer to peer support. I'm a, a great advocate for that um, because we're not always the experts. But if someone does have a specific question, please generate it to us and we'd be happy to try and point you in the right direction. So Dr. Chung, I'd like to thank you again for your time. It's been a pleasure. And um, now I know we're both in the same city and not too far away. I, I hope our paths will cross a little bit more. Jill, mm -hmm. always a pleasure for you to be here and, and share your, your expertise and, and all your advocacy and, and strategic planning out there that you do for our, our population. And not forgetting the lovely Teresa Schumard, who's out there as well in our um, on the wings, fueling out questions um, for us. So, thank Teresa, you. thank you. Thank you, everyone. Great, great session. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. And if you don't um, mind, Teresa, can we just end with our thank you and absolutely um, slide? So I think it's also very important to highlight some of the people that uh, lend their support to us. Um, we want to thank the groups here, Jazz Pharmaceuticals, Fisher & Paykel, and Takeda for um, the Awake Together Summit was made possible by their unrestricted educational grants. Um, and, and we appreciate your support and um, hope we can be um, working all together soon and, and getting it out there so people get the help and the great sleep that they need. <laughs> yes. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye now.